Welcome, everybody. A warm welcome to you all to this uh, water talk of the Water Institute. My name is Roy Brouwer. I'm the director of the Water Institute here on campus at the University of uh, Waterloo. And it's my great honor to introduce Professor Joan Rose to you, who we have here today to give this uh, water talk. Um, Professor Joan Rose is an international expert in microbiology, water quality, and public health safety. She holds the Homer Nolan Chair in Water Research at Michigan State University in two different departments, the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife and Plant, Soil and Microbiological Science. And she leads the Global Water Pathogens Project in partnership with UNESCO. Professor Rose furthermore serves on the EPA Science Advisory Board for the Great Lakes and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the American Academy, Academy of Microbiology. Professor Rose has published more than 300 manuscripts. Her work addresses the use of new molecular tools for surveying and mapping water pollution for recreational and drinking water, irrigation water, coastal and ballast waters, assessments of innovative water treatment technology for the developed and developing world, and the use of quantitative microbial risk assessments. For this work, Professor Rose has won several prizes in the various areas that she's active. She's the 2001 recipient of the Clark Water Prize and she won the prestigious Stockholm Water Prize last year in 2016. She has recently been awarded honorary citizenship in Singapore for her contributions to water quality, water education, and Singapore's water security for TAPS program. The title of Dr. Rose's talk today is Monitoring Pathogen concentrations in sewage to inform treatment goals and public health risks. Please join me in giving Professor Joan Rose a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks so much. That was a long introduction. <laughs> I appreciate it. And it's great to be here. Um, I, uh, I love the Great Lakes and um, appreciate uh, everyone that works in the water space uh, because we need, if we're gonna solve the big global water problems, we need everyone's intellect and energy uh, to address these problems in an interdisciplinary fashion. So as you heard, I'm a microbiologist. I'm trained in microbiology, but I work um, in engineering in full-scale engineering systems. So I work in that space between public health and engineering. And uh, you know, uh, when we talk about water, we often talk about water is life. Um, and I, uh, what I say is water quality is health. So I'm gonna talk to you today about um, pathogen monitoring and particularly in an area that I think has been neglected and that is focusing in on wastewater treatment and sanitation and what we may need to do there. And I've got some case studies to share with you. So I would still contend that waste and fecal excreta are the largest threat to biological safety in the world. Um, and it's not just in the developing regions of the world that we see these problems, where we know that excreta untreated is being discharged directly into the water. We have our own problems. We have uh, many septic tanks that are failing, and we actually don't know that they're failing uh, and impacting waterways. We also have, with, with climate changes and um, aging infrastructure, our wastewater uh, treatment, which was brought in to the Americas um, and in the, uh, the 50s and 60s, brought into law in the United States with the Clean Water Act, uh, it hasn't actually changed for 30 years. So what we built in the 70s is what is there now. Um, and uh, we still are um, uh, influenced by these issues. Now these are the grand challenges in what I call sanitation science. Um, you know, we have hundreds of different kinds of disease-causing organisms. And also there's con chemical constituents, but as a microbiologist I'm going to show my bias and talk about the microorganisms. But we have these emerging contaminants, emerging pathogens, they're found in sewage. They cause a whole slew of different diseases and we have very little data on their occurrence. We just assume that we're going to be taking care of these various microbes uh, by wastewater treatment or disinfection practices. And I often say disinfection is more of an art in wastewater than a science. 
we throw chlorine at it. We've historically known that we throw chlorine at it. We can get rid of the bacteria, but can we really control other things? Climate is impacting our infrastructure. If you think about our leaks, and we know we have leaks in drinking water, but we try to address those leaks in drinking water. Imagine wastewater. Wastewater systems leak. And what goes in comes out. And so wastewater systems, whether you've used a combined system to build your infrastructure or not, where you purposely brought your stormwater uh, into your sewage treatment plant, every wastewater treatment plant, the flows go up when it rains. The flows go up when it rains. So that means there's less time in the treatment. The water flows through the wastewater treatment in less time. Less time means less treatment. So these climate uh, impacts, and especially storms, are a problem. We've currently used an indicator system, E. coli, a bacterial indicator system, to say whether the treatment is adequate, whether water is safe. And this is no longer adequate. It doesn't give us the information we need to decide where we're going to spend our dollar. And we are now um, in an era where wastewater reuse, both inadvertent wastewater reuse, where wastewater is impacting our water supplies and our recreational waters, and planned reuse is on the increase dramatically across the globe. And that will continue. So we do need investment in R&D, research and development, knowledge to practice, implementation of innovation. These are the things we need. Now, waterborne disease are a global problem. We have parasites like cryptosporidium. That is spread throughout the world. And so you can see from the map that we are, have quite a bit of crypto in, in the Americas, in North America. Cholera and typhoid, which we've controlled through water treatment and sanitation and other means in most developed regions of the world. These are the iconic uh, bacterial species that cause waterborne disease. They're still very prominent. In fact, typhoid is now picking up antibiotic resistance and causing outbreaks associated with antibiotic resistance. Rotavirus, one of the key uh, viruses that is associated with mortality in developing regions of the world, particularly Africa. But in fact, rotavirus is still a big problem in the United States. It's just that a mother in the United States, or a father, can take their child to the doctor pretty quick if the kid gets sick with severe diarrhea. And they do take their children to the doctors. We have access to health care here that they don't have there. So we still get rotavirus. And despite having a vaccine, the uptake of the vaccine for rotavirus is not very good around the world. And in some cases, there's a discussion on whether how well it works. So these waterborne diseases are a problem. They're coming from excreta. They're coming from human waste and animal waste. And of course, this is a global issue. It's not a local issue. Um, you probably saw the headlines as the Olympics were being held uh, in Brazil about the sewage problems there in the waterways. Um, so this becomes uh, a, an issue of, uh, that affects what we do in the world and as the world is connected with various events. We've also had numerous outbreaks of very interesting um, you know, important lessons to be learned. The Campylobacter outbreak in New Zealand recently, Clostridium dif difficile, the first um, waterborne uh, outbreak um, identified with that particular uh, bacteria, which is normally associated with hospitals and diarrhea in the elderly, um, was due to a cross connection in Finland. Um, Guillain Barre syndrome which occurred both on the Arizona side and the Mexico side, a cluster of paralytic uh, uh, cases. And we miss the diarrhea. If you have a Campylobacter outbreak, you get diarrhea first. Then you get paralytic disease. So how many people actually had diarrhea here that we didn't catch on both sides of the border? So very interesting outbreaks. And of course, polio, we're trying to eradicate that. We have a vaccine. It rears its ugly head every once in a while in different places. And uh, of course, cholera continues to plague uh, different parts of the world. Billions lack sewage treatment. And in fact, they lack access to even sewers or flush toilets. Um, 
If they do have toilets, these, uh, this excreta goes right into the environment. And so we are not, for the most part, treating the waste um, that enter into the environment. Now you can imagine, we've had the great acceleration since 1950s across the world. Increased population, increased animal population. Feed the future, right? Decrease um, wetlands, change in our landscape. All of these things are contributing to the movement of these pathogens through the water system. We should know also that, you know, we live close to waterways. We live very close to coastal systems, marine coastal systems, and we put our waste there. That affects our recreational waters. It could affect our drinking water at some point as we start to desalinate more um, in terms of making sure that those uh, new technologies, if we're going to use ocean water or marine water for our drinking supply, uh, is taking out constituents. But we use regular water treatment uh, for most of our uh, fresh waters. And so our rivers, our, our millions of miles of rivers, are highly polluted around the world. That's where we discharge our waste. So I contend to you that around the world, in the United States, in Canada, fresh water systems are degrading. They're degrading. They're getting more nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, causing ecosystem disruptions with algal blooms, more hazardous algal blooms. We can find more pathogens in these systems. It means that we're having more problems with our recreational. Where there is monitoring, there's more beach closures having problems with our drinking water, and of course our food systems where there's irrigation. And these systems are all connected. Now I work in this space of animal and, and, and uh, human feces. Um, you know, uh, if your, your, your parents uh, when you are a kid used to call you queen of the latrine, I don't know if that influences your career choice. Um, but they said, what do you do exactly after I spent years getting my PhD? And I said, well, basically, I follow the feces around. And wherever there's feces, I try to go. And they're like, oh, that doesn't sound really nice. <laughs> so these feces impact all of our waterways. Our waterways are connected to our food system. It's connected to our human system. And our human system is changing, too. The socials, our social structures are changing. Our sensitive populations and any one time, a given snapshot of any community, 25% of our population is in a sensitive group, subgroup. And all of us are going to go through one of those subgroups at one point in our lives. But any snapshot, that means 25%. Immunocompromised, pregnant, young children, elderly, diabetics. And these individuals are growing in our, in our culture. Now, we're talking now about thinking in better, broader terms about sanitation science and moving it to what we call resource recovery. That might be the future of wastewater. It means that we can get energy, nutrients, and water. Water is the great dissolver, and we use water to move things around. But we need to recover that water, and we need to recover some of the things that are in water that are going to be beneficial, rather than disposing them. Now, energy recovery is starting to drive some of this. If you look in Vietnam, and this is for animal waste, they're starting to put up these bioreactors everywhere because they can get energy out of them, and they can treat the waste. But what they're finding is that people are using the water and these bioreactors are not taking care of the pathogens. In fact, the, the, the effluent, the water coming out of the bioreactors that they're using in irrigation and agriculture is loaded with Giardia and Cryptosporidium parasites. So a bioreactor alone as a single barrier is not going to make it safe for reuse. So while energy was driving this, you're getting the waste away from the, the immediate community, you are creating a source that's not safe for reuse. So we have to think about reusing and safety. Now you probably all know about these global trends, urbanization, population growth, regional growth. Travel and tourism is a big one, uh, tied to water. 
Some countries, uh, tourism is uh, 60 to 80 percent of their GDP. So tourism becomes very important. Water quality becomes important. The global food market, and I already mentioned water and resource, uh, resource recovery. So I basically try to answer these questions in a, in a group around the world. How is water quality changing? What is the role of sewage in this change in quality? How does this affect human health? And how can new te technology help us with determining what kind of treatment technology do we need? If we're going to reinvent the toilet, as Gates Foundation says, move from treating sewage to resource recovery, if we're going to restore our wastewater infrastructure, how, what are we going to use and how are we going to make sure it's safe? We try to look at the interface of three areas. Risk analysis, which helps us understand the risk, um, brings in community values, what's safe, um, the economics, use good environmental methods and data to generate information that that uh, provides the knowledge for the decision making. And to get to that, to get to the technology, use the technology to get at these, uh, at these data. Um, we want to have science-based, data-driven approaches. We want, but we've got emerging methods and emerging contaminants. And these go hand in hand, because as we use the new technology, we find new things. I'll show you some examples of that. And then, of course, we've got the green and blue economy. Um, and it's estimated to be pretty large when you think about investment in the future. The um, economic estimates on sanitation generally say for every dollar invested is a $4 return to the community. So I think we need to elevate the discussion on wastewater treatment and wastewater itself. We need to think of it as part of the important component of the one water concept. So getting people to think, when I flush that toilet and that water starts flowing, where does it go? How does that impact my tap, my river, my lake? Where does that water go? I think we need to build more pilot technology, uh, have more technology pilot plants built around the world. And as we invest in research and development, and I was very interesting in, in talking to faculty and students this morning because you have a connection to the global world, a connection to field sites in Africa. This is extremely important that we don't neglect R&D in other parts of the world. We need to use the most advanced diagnostics. We need water diagnostic tools, not compliance monitoring tools. And we're going to have to address uh, issues of efficiencies for the wastewater treatment industry. They have been in, stuck in limbo for the last 40 to 50 years. They are you doing the same thing that they've always done in the wastewater industry. If you're in an advanced wastewater reclamation facility, you're, you're meeting with people that have been trained, that are understanding what's going on with the one water cycle. If you go to a routine, regular wastewater treatment plant, you're working with people that are very skilled at doing what they've, they've been doing all along. In the US, they're talking about moving to a colophage standard. We've already talked about moving to an interocoxy standard at the beach, which is connected to swimmable under the Clean Water Act and our wastewater treatment. And the wastewater industry doesn't even know what those organisms are, let alone how to monitor them or what they mean for their wastewater treatment plant. Now, the diseases and the organisms that I, I look at and that I'm going to introduce you to are in three basic categories. I'm going to leave out the worms and the helmets, and I'm going to leave out the fungi. But you, you know, they pop in there every once in a while. But there's three main categories of what we call enteric pathogens. There's the virus group, there's the bacterial group, and the protist group. So there's about 110 different kinds of viruses that we can find in wastewater. These are nanobiological particles, right? They're nano. We can only see them under the electron microscope. They need a host to grow. They are inert in the environment. They're quite resistant little particles when they're in water. They like to move around. They move through soil because they're so small. And they survive very differently, as you can imagine, than bacteria. Now, our bacteria, a slew of bacteria, maybe about 20 that we worry about, 
Um, we use most of the time an indicator concept to cover that whole bacterial category, and that's E. coli. So E. coli is the workhorse of water quality in the world. It's the standard for drinking water. It's the standard for recreational water for most of the world. This is a bacteria that's in our gut. Everybody has it. Animals have it. Every warm-blooded animal has E. coli, has birds, as do birds and other mammals and humans. We all excrete E. coli, so it's an indicator. It indicates fecal pollution, but it doesn't tell us what the source is, and it certainly doesn't correlate with these other pathogens. It doesn't correlate with the viruses, and it doesn't correlate with the protozoa. Now, the protozoa, or the parasites, are little animals. They're in the animal kingdom. Uh, they infect our gut. They infect animals. They produce an we produce an egg-like structure in the feces, called an oocyst or a cyst. And again, these structures are very, very resistant to what we normally would use. In fact, cryptosporidium is completely resistant to chlorination, which we've used for drinking water and wastewater treatment for quite a long time. And so when cryptosporidium uh, came on the scene, the chlorine barrier that we thought, the disinfection barrier that we had in water was not working. Now, many people think, well, these enteric pathogens just cause diarrhea, just a little bit of diarrhea, don't worry about it. But we know now that there's a whole slew of other diseases associated with these pathogens, and there's chronic effects. So here's our water quality indicators. We use E. coli. We also use what we call enterococci. Enterococci is another indicator in another family uh, that um, uh, is uh, uh, used as an indicator and is being uh, suggested as a better indicator for recreational disease and whether you'll get sick if you use the beach. And we've used the coliforms and E. coli for a long time. In fact, E. coli was suggested to be used early in the late 1800s, but we didn't have a method to measure just E. coli. So we measured the coliform group. E. coli is a member of that coliform group, right? But we didn't have the method. We do have the method now. We moved to fecal coliforms, raise the temperature, we get fecal coliforms in the 40s and 50s. We now have ability to look just for E. coli, and now we have the ability to look for the pathogenic types of E. coli for pathogens. So the technology has moved us forward. We also have used traditional cultivation techniques. These techniques, we filter water, we either use a most probable number approach, MPN, it means that we dilute it out till it's zero, right? You have a sample, a water sample, and you dilute it, dilute it, dilute it in the lab until you get a zero. And that gives you a, an estimate. So you got a million organisms, you dilute it a million times, you get the zero. Then you have an estimate of the concentration. So we use these most probable number. And in fact, right now, can you believe this is a new technique that's just on the scene for developing regions of the world. It gives you E. coli, which we didn't have before, you can get E. coli, not just coliforms. And it gives you a most probable number. You don't need an incubator. And it's cheap. It's inexpensive. You can mix the media with your water sample. You can use this in Africa and other places to monitor water. But we also have the colophage. Now, why are colophage? Why am I mentioning the colophage? Colophage are viruses that impact bacteria. And in this case, a colophage infects E. coli. And colophage are related to fecal contamination. And why are colophage being promoted? One, they're a simple test. We grow up the bacteria in a host lawn. We mix the water sample with it. And the virus attacks the E. coli. We get these little holes, plaques. So we can count how many viruses are associated in the water. And because it's a virus, it is a good indicator of human viruses, of that group of pathogens we worry about. So it's an alternative indicator that people want to use. We also do pathogen monitoring. And there's not, I wouldn't say there's a, this is something that every water lab has. Most water labs will set up, water microbiology labs will set up and do the indicators. They can be trained to do the colophage. That's a pretty simple test. Um, but they don't do pathogen monitoring. Why? Pathogen monitoring takes more time, more money, and special equipment.
Now, first of all, for pathogens, we have to concentrate the water. So we take very large volumes of water. Uh, depends on the sample. If you're taking, looking at raw sewage, you might take five liters. If you're looking at treated sewage, you might take 30 liters. If you're looking at a river, you might take 50 liters. If you're looking at treated drinking water, you might take 100 to 1,000 liters. So you have to concentrate that sample through some kind of filter and then bring it back into the lab. In the case of viruses, we put it on cell culture. If the virus is there, it starts to kill the cells. In the case of parasites, we use a microscopic method. We first purify what's come, come off the filter with a paramagnetic bead and a, and a magnet. It can actually attach our parasite sister oocyst to this bead and pull it away. And then we use immunofluorescent microscopy. Here's Giardia and here's crypto um, under the microscope. And we have to count them. That's pretty labor intensive. Um, and you look to see whether you can see internal features and that type of thing. So this is pretty, pretty intensive work. Parasites usually, if you had to rush, you could do one sample in a day, but you generally would collect more than one sample and get anywhere from three to five samples in a week. Viruses, it could take two weeks to three weeks to get the results. So what have we done with enhanced water diagnostics? We've moved to molecular and DNA technology. That means we take the water sample, we extract the DNA out of the water sample. We design what we call primer sets. These are little pieces of DNA that you use in the instrument. Polymerase chain reaction, photocopy machine for DNA. And you can look for any pathogen of interest as long as you know the sequence. So you can design primers and look for any pathogen of interest. Now the changes to, to PCR over the, the last few years have been uh, really amazing because it has become quantitative. So we went from presence absence to quantitative. We can, we can count things now. We want to count things. But it has these advantages. It's often more sensitive. We can get at a detection levels that are lower. It's more time efficient. It could be more cost effective. Some of the methods it definitely is. If you compare it to cell culture and viruses, that's very expensive compared to qPCR. If you look at E. coli and you look at qPCR, qPCR is going to be higher than E. coli. So it depends on the organism. You can target specific pathogens, source tracking markers. One of our problems with E. coli is where did the pollution come from? So you've got a beach that's fecally polluted. You've got a lake. You've got a river. You've got a, a drinking water supply. Where did the pollution come from? So how do, we, how do we look at both risk and how do we control it? You can obtain rapid results, and you can uh, do quantitative. Now, of course, one of the disadvantages, and the water industry likes to point this out, is that um, we can't detect viable from non-viable. This looks at the DNA within the cell. And when we kill an organism with disinfection at a wastewater treatment plant, the numbers don't change pre and post chlorine. So we can look at removal with PCR, but we cannot look, not yet, can we use the molecular tools to look at whether the organism is alive or not. That's very important for certain processes in the wastewater treatment. But the growth and the use of PCR has been amazing in terms of when it was first discovered, um, in the 80s, um, first publication, um, the instruments that are available now, the kits that are available to run the analysis, and the QAQC that's part of the PCR has developed so that you can use these in a water plant. In fact, in Michigan, we're working with a consortium of 18 public health labs across the state. They are, all have QPCR machines. They're all being trained to use the machines for a whole variety of applications, including beach closures and beach pollution, source tracking, and Legionella. But there's been some advantages even to the PCR. Digital droplet. Digital droplet PCR. This takes the PCR to a most probable number format. It's amazing because you can do more than one target at the same time which is a big advantage. 
and it's more robust. You don't have the same QAQC. All the studies that have been published to date in using it in water say that our, our interferences are lower and we can compare one lab to another in terms of the concentrations we're getting. It's more precise. So this is a new development and we're seeing labs, environmental labs, start to purchase the digital droplet PCR system. Now let me just switch now and talk about wastewater treatment and reuse. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the studies where we're actually at full scale looking at pathogen removal uh, throughout the treatment train and what we're trying to learn about it. So first of all, in the United States, under the Clean Water Act in 1970s, this law said that all communities that have wastewater treatment that discharge to a surface water have to have what we call primary and secondary treatment. Before, there was only primary treatment. It took out the solids. In fact, in Canada, I know you don't have a, a Clean Water Act. And providence by providence, you decide whether you're going to treat the wastewater. And in fact, there's been some disputes across the border about Canada discharging untreated wastewater, whereas the US says they're, they're discharging treated wastewater. But even on the US side, where we are, we have a lot of what we call combined sewer overflows. We linked our stormwater to our wastewater. Those have to be fixed. Those must be fixed by law now. But most places aren't fixing them. They won't get them totally fixed till 2018, 2020. So we have what we call routine wastewater treatment. Routine wastewater treatment. It mostly uh, nitrifies the wastewater. You go from ammonia to nitrate. It takes out the solids, takes that turbidity down. Um, it takes down the organic load that causes uh, anaerobic conditions when you discharge wastewater to a water. So that's routine. But what is reclaimed water? So reclaimed water, in most states, it's by state by state in the United States, each state has its own rule, says that you can reuse wastewater for beneficial purposes, but it must be safe for reuse. So what are your purposes? In some cases, it's just irrigation. It could be irrigation of grasses, golf courses, things like that. And in fact, in, the Flor in Florida, when they started first using wastewater reuse way back in the 80s, viruses were a big thing. And I remember um, uh, you know, the, the, the public health department was very worried about golfers on uh, these golf courses with reclaimed water. And so viruses were a big target in reclaimed water early on in the history of the United States. Now states with the most wastewater re reuse, as you can imagine, are the states that have the most population are in the south and in the west where there's water stress. So water stress has pre precipitated the, the reuse of wastewater. And rules, even in water-rich areas, are starting to think about return flows and reuse. So Minnesota right now is starting to think about their rules about reuse. Seattle in Washington has started to think about reuse. But even in this region, in the Great Lakes, Great Lakes region, we have a water quality agreement. That agreement says that we should return flows of equal quality to the water that we took from the Great Lakes. So if we take water from the Great Lakes, one of the Lake Michigan, and from one of our, our pipes, we use it in our community, we return the flow, we use it in our power plants, we return the flow, we even use it in our agricultural, and we return some of the flow, it is not coming back in the same quality, obviously. So this is an issue as well. Now, some people have set goals for pathogen reduction. This was not necessarily done on a risk basis, but they just set what they thought they could measure and what they thought they could achieve early on. So anything like, they thought they could achieve five log reduction of viruses in California. That's one of the goals. It's mostly with chlorination. And then when the parasites came on, they said, oh, we gotta get rid of the crypto, we can't do it with disinfection. So we, we wanna get rid of it with filtration. So you have to enhance filtration to get rid of those oocysts, those egg-like structures. So let me tell you what a log is. You might not know what a log reduction is, some of you. If I say 90% reduction, that's one log. 99%, two logs. 99.9%, three logs. 99.99%, four logs, right? These pathogens may come into sewage, and this is where we were lacking the data, at a million. So how many logs do you need to get 
down to non-detect if you've got a million coming in and, and untreated sewage. Six logs to get down to non-detect if they're coming in at a million, right? So this is why in microbiology we talk about these large removals, 99.99%, 99.9999%, large removals of pathogens for sewage. Now let me just show you some data right here. Let me orient you for this graph. These are three different wastewater treatment plants uh, around the United States. This was some early work that we did with a consortium uh, looking at wastewater reclamation facilities that were being used for non, what I call non-potable purposes. This water was being used for irrigation. It was not being used purposely for drinking water to go into your drinking water plant. The, these are box plots. So here's the log concentration, 100, 10,000, a million. This is the influent, this is the effluent. This is what's coming in, this is what's coming out, in and out. Three different plants. Indicators, coliforms, fecal coliforms, and E. coli, enterococci, a spore former, clostridia, the colophage, and viruses, giardia, cryptosporidium. So the last three boxes on each of these are the pathogens, and the remaining boxes are the indicators. So let, let me tell you what we learned. Well, first of all, we learned that there's a high variability between one plant and another as to what's coming into the sewage treatment plant. We could not say that from one community to another, you were going to have consistent concentrations or consistent distributions of pathogens coming into that wastewater treatment plant. They're gonna be variable. This plant was very consistent. Every time you took a sample, you had very similar numbers coming in through that community. We don't know, we don't understand why one community has consistent numbers of pathogens and indicators coming into their sewage treatment plant, and another facility has a high vi variation. It could be the leakiness of the sewer. The sewer is causing dilution when it rains and so you get this high variation. Um, it could be uh, uh, the nature of the community and sewer. Um, now the next thing to look at is the effluent. Now this plant had high variability, high concentrations, but this plant did a great job at reducing these, mostly reducing things down to non-detects, mostly non-detects. This plant, which had very high concentrations but less variability, had much higher variability in the treatment process. So the treatment process was letting indicators through, letting pathogens through at a much greater uh, variability. So here we had much greater risk than at this plant. Here we had much greater variability in the influent. This plant had some variability, but also some high numbers. While the variability was not high, it was not getting the removal that it needed. So this meant we had to go to the full-scale plant and get enough samples of influent and effluent over a year's time to, to gather this information. Um, and so it wasn't easy. And they began to see that the initial evaluation of indicators and pathogens around the U.S. at full scale did not provide them with the data to have a consistent approach at the state level to how much removal was going to be safe. So how do we understand risk reduction? We think that the wet weather events produce high flow rates in treatment systems, and it probably reduces microbial efficacy. So what we found was hydraulic retention time. That is the time that the water stays in the wastewater plant influences the treatment. Now this might have been too intuitive, really, when you think about it, but I remember the first time I told the engineers that they were gonna to have to increase the hydraulic retention time in the wastewater treatment plant, they about fainted because they'd have to build a great big basin about the size of this room to accommodate the flows. And they couldn't do it. So when the flows went up, things went through the plant quickly. You didn't get the removal of pathogens that you wanted and they couldn't engineer. They couldn't engineer it with the conventional treatment approach to increase that hydraulic retention time. 
So we needed new designs. There were some new things that were handling high flows, handling wet weather, but those had not been evaluated for pathogens. Water reuse was starting to look at quality for potable needs, not just for irrigation of crops, but you take the wastewater all the way to your drinking water plant on your drink, and, and it supplies the water for your drinking water plant and it goes to, uh, to the tap or it goes to your groundwater system where you pull your water out. So what we call potable wastewater reuse was being explored, it was being expanded, especially in California, in Virginia, expanded, and expanded around the world. Now, California decided via their groundwater recharge for potable that they needed 12 log removal, I'm not gonna say how many 9999s that is, of virus, 10 log removal of crypto, and 10 log removal of uh, Giardia to be safe. 12 10 10 it's called, from untreated sewage to the finished facility for potable reuse. 12 10 10. So that's not possible to do by just measuring influent and effluent. You have to look at each barrier independently and say, can you add it up to a 12 log removal? Texas, on the other hand, decided that it should be 10, 8, 8. And you should assume that secondary wastewater treatment is already achieving certain log reductions. Now, we don't have um, any national or even at the state level requirement for pathogen reduction for routine wastewater treatment plants. In routine wastewater treatment plants, there is no requirement for pathogen reduction, only indicators. So all the routine wastewater treatment plants that are going to go to reclaim water, could they assume these log removals by their wastewater treatment plant up front? That became the question. Was the 12 log good enough? Why, was it too much? So there was a need to understand pathogen concentrations. So here's the California rule and the Texas rule. Now, they focused on this risk level, 10 to the minus 4. This is a risk level. It's been codified in law in the Netherlands, but it has not been codified in law anyplace else. But it's been suggested as a target. What does that mean? For drinking water, you should not have more than one infection and population of 10,000 in a year. Drinking water should not contribute to more than one infection in a population of 10,000 in a year. That's how safe they want drinking water to be for infectious diseases control. And so they used the same risk target, but they made different assumptions about their wastewater treatment. Now I want to tell you and end by giving you some case studies. Um, a California system, a routine activated sludge system. One side of it was old, one side of it was newer. Um, that's thinking of going to potable reuse has to meet the 12 10 10 in California. In Ohio, a system that is combined wastewater stormwater system, the flows change dramatically. They built some innovative technology called high rate clarification that they run both of these trains when it rains. You can see these flows. This is a small little system in California. Sorry, I, I didn't change it to liters, million gallons per day. <laughs> And um, Ohio, uh, these Ohio, you can see how big these flows are. This is a big wastewater plant. This is a very large wastewater plant that serves a lot of people. And the flow goes up significantly when it rains. So let's take a look at this. First, the Ohio system. So the Ohio system is very um, uh, similar to a routine. You pump in the raw sewage, you have a grit removal. Um, it takes out the big stuff. How many people have been to a wastewater plant in this room? All right, we do have a good percentage of understands uh, what it looks like. These are pretty big, you know, basins. So grit removal. Um, this, when it rains, fills up this equalization basin. It goes to high rate clarification. Then it goes to chlorine, dis chlorine disinfection and discharge. 
The other side goes through routine, um, primary clarifiers, that means the solids fall out, aeration basins where you get the activated sludge going and you get nitrification and you get the oxygen demanding or, uh, organics degraded. Um, then you clarify that again, you put it in something where the solids fall out, the microbes fall out, and you go through a chlorine basin. So the question they had were, are the two sides equivalent in removal of pathogens? So let's take a look at the data, some of the data. Now this is E. coli, this is our tr traditional indicator. The high rate clarification are the open circles, and the dark are the routine um, activated sludge. So these are the type of concentrations coming in, about a million coming in, 100,000 E. coli's coming in. We get pretty good reductions through activated sludge. Um, we get less reduction through high clarification. But when we get to disinfection, for the most part, we're able to uh, achieve the standard only on occasion. Um, uh, are we not able to see these are replicates and other things, but only on occasion you see something up near the, the upper boundary of where we're trying to reach our standards. But for the most part, after we disinfect, we can still achieve what we need to achieve with disinfection with E. coli, even though this process is not working as well as activated sludge. Now let's look at enterococci. Enterococci is even worse in terms of removal. Now enterococci is a little round bacterium. It's very different than E. coli. Um, and normally we think of enterococci as being more resistant to chlorine than E. coli. So even though the removal was poorer at this stage, by the time we got to disinfection, we actually were able to achieve greater disinfection of enterococci than we were in the routine system. Now keep in mind that this is under high flow conditions. So both treatment trains are running at high flow. So if we looked at the activated sludge on normal conditions, we might be able to get it down here. But it's at high flow, and it's not as efficient. You can see that we cannot remove enterococci as well as we can remove E. coli. Now this is what colophage looks like, that little virus. They're there, are pretty high numbers. Again, the high rate clarification cannot remove those as well. And we can't disinfect it. We have much high variability, much greater variability in trying to disinfect viruses. What I'm saying is when we add chlorine to a wastewater plant, we don't actually know how to kill them. We don't know how to get consistent inactivation of viruses. What's interesting about this is that when this comes out of these two systems, there are different size particles. And those particles are attaching to our microbes. Those particles are interfering with disinfection. So for bacteria, E. coli, we could achieve the disinfection. For these nanoparticles, these nanoparticles, for viruses, normally we should be able to inactivate them with chlorine in a wastewater plant. But here we cannot. And you can only see less than two log removal less than two wrong removal of viruses. So this is what it looks like when you look at the numbers, influent to disinfection. We also looked at cultivatable viruses, and we looked at adenoviruses. And when we looked at adenoviruses, remember I told you there's 100 different kinds of viruses. We did not achieve the same inactivation. So we are, we can see that a high rate removes some, activated sludge removes some, but the major barrier to producing safe wastewater in a conventional plant or even in, in, in a new design is disinfection. And if we do not know how to disinfect our wastewaters, then we're not going to be able to achieve safety for wastewater and wastewater reuse in the future. Now the other facility we looked at was again a routine wastewater treatment plant, primary clarifiers, Air digesters, all kinds of little basins, secondary clarifiers, chlorine. It had two sides to it, one which was a newer system and one which was an older system. I'm not going to show you that data, but I'm going to just show you the variability of the two trains. The two trains had different water quality. Even though the raw sewage coming in was the same, 
the old train had a different water quality than the new train. And this is the kind of variability we see. This is the concentration per liter. This is the viruses. This is raw sewage, primary sewage, and then disinfected, secondary disinfected sewage. These are, the, these are a distribution. These are the concentrations that you see. So we're seeing about one virus, one to 10 viruses coming out in the effluent per liter. Per liter, right? That doesn't meet the 12 log removal one. Uh, this is what the virus looks like if we use molecular tools with our cell culture. So remember I said that that cell culture takes two weeks. Well, we can speed that up by putting the viruses on cells and then taking those cells after they grow the virus a little bit and using molecular tools to identify the virus. Here we're going to get more viruses than we got with the regular method. We're going to see more viruses. And we saw that, whoops, we saw that here. Well, let's see. Let me go back. There we go. ICC, Integrated Cell Culture PCR, this is called. And here you can see the numbers. Still some, a similar concentration, but we're getting much less removal. Finally, we could use qPCR. Now, this just looks at the virus particles. This just looks at the virus particles. And, and qPCR is more accurate, has some precision to it, but we can't tell whether they're alive or not. We can only talk about physical removal. But again, remember, are we really getting disinfection? So are we worried about this? That we're seeing very little removal, very high virus numbers. So there's a lot of viruses in our sewage that with our routine methods that have been approved are not detecting that. So our new diagnostics tell us something different about what, how we're removing viruses in these wastewater treatment plants at full scale. Again, this is the colophage. The colophage went up to about 10 per liter. And you could see approximately a two log removal with the colophage. Um, and this is the cultivation test. This is cryptosporidium, the parasites. And this is what Giardia looks like. So Giardia is pretty big. And it comes out in the secondary system. But you've got the the new plant achieving very low numbers, and you've got the, new, the old plant achieving, not achieving uh, the same quality of, uh, of uh, effluent that you wanted. Here's some of our numbers. So you can see not really big reductions in some cases. We're able to achieve most of it through disinfection. And you can see that if we look at them side by side, this is California. These are log reductions, one log and two logs. Reduction of phage, salmonella, crypto, and giardia. The California is doing much better than the Ohio plant in terms of removal. So wastewater treatment is highly varied, even in the United States even where we have laws, even where we think we've built the systems to be pretty similar. So what are we going to do for the rest of the world? And here's what the high rate and uh, activated sludge looks like. So let me just say that the future for reclaimed water, there will be more reclaimed water in, in the future around the world. There's going to be more potable reuse. That means more wastewater plants are going to go to potable reuse. There's going to be more resource recovery. In fact, in Michigan, they've said they want all wastewater plants to go to resource recovery. And so I was at a meeting, and um, one of the wastewater plants had changed their name. And I said, well, what did you do to, to become a resource recovery plant? Nothing. We just changed our name. Isn't that the first step? And I'm like, uh, OK, maybe we should be measuring some colophage. What's that? So we got a long, long ways to go. Even though we have some aspirations, we have some aspirations that we're stating. We don't really know what that means. And people are, are thinking about changing their name. Um, we have to look at these pathogens, because these are the things causing the disease. And we're going to have to look at how do we optimize our treatment designs. That means engineering and public health 
and water microbiologists and laboratory diagnostics and technicians are all going to have to come together to move sanitation science forward. It cannot be done by one discipline alone. We all have to come together to, to actually make this happen. And one of the things that you think about where there's no wastewater treatment plant in a community in Africa and they want to build something and they could maybe build a resource recovery system that could give them energy, nutrients, water for maybe irrigating things. You want to make sure it's safe. So what are we going to do in the rest of the world where they start to try to meet the sustainable development goals on sanitation? We need more barriers, multiple barriers at the wastewater treatment plant itself. They're going to use membranes for potable reuse. They're going to have to have reliability, and there's going to have to be more monitoring. One of the things for sure is that the public gets engaged when you start saying you're going to put wastewater into your drinking water. They don't get as engaged, uh, they don't think about their toilet flush too much until you say that that toilet flush is going to influence your drinking water. Then the public starts to get engaged. But we do need public engagement, ultimately, because wastewater generally costs more than drinking water side. So bills go up, and people are upset. They don't want to talk about feces. They don't want to have any toilet talk. And, and so we need to have that conversation with the public, because ultimately, we'll have to, the public will have to say whether they're going to pay for these advances. Now, how do, are we doing on time? Because I just have a few more slides that I might talk about the metagenomics in viruses. Five minutes, OK. So metagenomics, all full DNA. Use new methods. New methods in which we can concentrate these different organisms. We can set them up at a wastewater treatment plant. This is at a reclaimed water system that's being used for potable reuse, by the way. We can get all the DNA in there. Now, why is this interesting? Because we are now seeing this wide array of viruses that we, you know, you look under the lamppost with your methods, right? Your methods help you look where the light shines. This method helps you look very, very broadly. I want to point out that the bacteriophage are a huge component in any water uh, virome data set. What are those bacteria viruses doing? They're influencing the bacteria that are in that system. We also find a healthy, now the plant viruses probably coming from our food. We get the human viruses. What are all these animal viruses doing in there? And what was interesting is we found a high percentage of this Circoviridae family. It's a single-stranded DNA virus. We also found that activated sludge, raw sewage, trickling filter effluents were really similar. But once you treated it with microfiltration, you got a very different virome. So we're seeing different viruses downstream of different processes once we start advanced, looking at advanced treatment. Now, the Circoviridae is a single-stranded DNA virus. Its, its DNA is circular. Actually, it's one of the smallest viruses we can find in the water environment. It causes pig diarrhea. And in fact, a few years ago, your pork prices were high in North America. They went way up because we had a mass uh, kill, die off of pigs, piglets in particular, because of this virus. Now, there's been new, a new virus found that's really related to this family called cyclovirus, and it's been causing neurological problems in kids in Asia. It's like polio virus. It's fecal oral, you get it through ingestion, it's excreted in the feces, and it cause, causes paralytic disease. And it's been found in pigs. We don't know whether it's jumping to any people in the United States yet, but it's in our sewage. The Circoviridae is in our sewage at a very high level. Um, so we've got new, a new virus to think about. Is, is, it, uh, is it in our sewage because our sewers are leaky and we've got farm and animal waste? Are, are people excreting this virus and we don't know about it yet? So we're running a global system on water pathogens. We're trying to answer how much treatment is needed and what is safe. We're looking at concentrations and how we reduce those concentrations and various exposures. Irrigation, how do we use effluent for irrigation? How do we use effluent to, that impacts our potable water? How do we use effluent 
that goes into a river where people are washing their clothes and bathing because they use that river for hygiene. What about recreation? So what is appropriate for wastewater treatment? Where should routine wastewater treatment be in regard to pathogen reduction? That conversation has not happened yet. Recommendations is my last slide. Then we can, I think, go to Q&A. I think we should use advanced technologies and develop a water diagnostic tool set. This is not just for wastewater, but for our, our water basins, our watersheds. We've got, water, uh, we've got um, source tracking markers now that we can use. Um, Legionella is showing up in our distribution systems. I know Toronto had a big outbreak of Legionnaires. So we've got a distribution system, a treated water distribution system and biofilms we need to, to look at. We need water diagnostic tools. We're going to have to spend money. We need to improve wastewater management and return flows, recycle, reuse to address future water quality issues. We need to develop the 21st century water diagnostic labs that go along with this goal. We have to train people. And in fact, we recognize that people being trained in public health and they're in the laboratory right now working. They were not trained in using PCR machines. They were not trained in handling large water samples and running the molecular tools. So even the pipetting and all the different things, the little things that you wouldn't think about, they had no training in that. So that training is needed. Globally, we're coming to an agreement that for routine wastewater treatment plant, we'd like to see three log removal of, of viruses from a re routine wastewater treatment plant. So I want to thank my group. They all help with this, especially Tiong Ah and Iso Kim. They've done a lot of the metagenomics. And the group all have to get involved every time we get a sample in from these uh, wastewater uh, facilities. Um, and so, and then I'll end with some beautiful pictures of the Great Lakes and the water systems we're trying to protect. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Who wants to kick off? First, just give me a second. Hi, Dr. Rose. Uh, thanks for your talk. I um, actually just had a question about balancing risk with reward in terms of water reuse. Um, so I've done some work with the federal government in Canada trying to, we're trying to update the building codes to encourage water efficiency. Mm -hmm. And part of that was developing a section about rainwater harvesting reuse and the next section will be about grey water reuse. Grey water reuse. Yes. Okay. So the rainwater harvesting section was very contentious already because the government prefers a zero risk approach, but they also want to encourage these practices. So I'm just wondering, where does, how does this balance get struck? Like where, I found myself, I'm, I'm a water efficiency person, so I was fighting for the permissive approach, whereas everyone who works for government says, no, there's, there's a single bacteria that's in there and it's not safe and we need to, so as it stands, rainwater is permitted for underground irrigation and things that, that rainwater shouldn't be relegated to. So I'm just wondering how, how does this process become balanced between the risk and the rewards? Yeah, so, um, so our regulatory framework often puts uh, barriers in. And so there's no such thing as zero risk. Um, and, and so we have these indicators. So for example, in the Virgin Islands, they um, were using rainwater harvesting systems for potable water. It had to meet the, uh, the one E. coli, less than one E. coli per 100 mils. But when they added chlorine or, you know, uh, they got disinfection byproducts that were over the standard. And so they were trying to look, do we have to meet this standard? Are there other pathogens present? Um, does it make sense? Um, what are we going to, are there alternative treatments other than chlorine that would be, um, a pro, because uh, the U.S. government says you have to have a chlorine residual. And, and these were for public systems like schools and hospitals. They used rainwater catchment system in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So they did go in with a risk-based approach, uh, but they had to fund to get some data. And what they found that was that the most of the roof catchment systems did have Giardia and Crypto 
They had, so they had pathogens and pathogens that were resistant to chlorine so that if you could put UV on, you would be better off than trying to mandate a chlorine residual and then you got the DBPs and all of this kind of thing. But they needed data and they needed a regulatory framework that was willing to come in and say, let's uh, manage this differently, this situation differently. Now, in the, in the case of gray water and rainwater harvesting, most rainwater harvesting, in fact, doesn't have any regulatory, unless you're going to use it for drinking water, uh, framework. Um, in fact, they were promoting it in, in Georgia, and rain barrels were like going out of the stores because when they had the drought. So uh, rainwater doesn't, even though it could have some things for, for most irrigation purposes, it doesn't really fall under any regulatory framework. Now, gray water, on the other hand, has a lot of stuff in it. Um, and in fact, they banned it in many places, uh, gray water reuse, because the implementation of the rule is very difficult. You have to make sure that each homeowner is doing the right thing. And so gray water tended to be more problematic. They didn't have any data on how many pathogens might be there, what, what kind of treatment should the homeowner get, how would the homeowner maintain that. You know, it's not as simple as the point of use device is that we put on our tap, where we have a system all set up, you know, National uh, Sanitation Foundation and others to verify. So we don't have that system set up for reuse at the individual homeowner's side. Um, and so, you know, I think many policy groups don't want to deal with it at all. First, they don't want to invest in the data that they might have to gather to make the decisions. Then they don't see the available technology for the individual homeowner to make decisions to reduce it. Um, and, and they don't know anything about the cost. Is it cost effective to maintain that? And, and uh, then they can't be assured that the homeowner is going to adhere to the regulatory framework. How do you, how do you manage that? And so it tends to just get, get, get uh, brushed aside. And I do think that the benefit side is very often just neglected. It's, it, it, they, and they don't know how to assess the benefit side very well. Especially how many homes, if they had this system in place, would, would that help with conservation? You know, it goes back to the, the early reclamation for, for lawns that they did in St. Petersburg. They, they had a lot of problems with that uh, in the regulatory framework, but they started running out of water. So they built the purple pipe system. They met all their new demands in the less, next 15 years, water demands through the purple pipe system for irrigation of, of lawns. But it, the first initial part of it was a huge fight, a huge fight. It took a long time, probably a decade. Bill, Bill you want? What? Just curious what, about your view uh, in a Great Lakes context, what the relative risk is to the you know, denizens of the Great Lakes from uh, drinking water and recreational exposure to, in, a, in pathogens. Yeah, so, so in the Great Lakes, generally, the, on the drinking water side, those communities that have pipes out into the lake have very good water. The ones that are, are suffering are the ones that are like in Saginaw Bay, Lake Erie. They, they get their water pipes from near shore, or they get their water, water from, uh, from shallow bays. And they're suffering not so much from fecal contamination, but from the uh, toxic algal blooms. Although in Lake Erie, that South Bass, Bass Island was probably from their wastewater disposal in that island, their, their management of wastewater. So drinking water, the more problematic in the Great Lakes is the people using groundwater. So they're using, and, and, and in Canada, that was already uh, addressed to a certain extent, or it was at least realized how much it's been addressed because of Walkerton. When Walkerton happened, Canada took note, the, you know, that whole, uh, I don't know how many people know about Walkerton, but you can probably Google it, a, a very serious outbreak in a small community, um, farming community where people, you know, children died, uh, you know, kidney transplants, all of that kind of thing from animal manure and a groundwater system. But groundwater system is generally not monitored as well. It's not treated as well. We have a lot of people on their own wells. We don't necessarily have a mandate for treatment, disinfection of, of groundwater in small communities. So I think it's those people on groundwater. So we're lacking data on what to do about people on groundwater, uh, especially on the US side. We have not done somewhat what you've done on the Canada side because of Walkerton from the national side. 
Recreational waters, I think we have hot spots. And we know, at least via E. coli, we have data on which beaches, because of the monitoring that's come in with the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes beaches, not our inland beaches though. Our inland beaches, we don't have monitoring data and there's probably a lot of risk there. But we do know where the hot spots are. We do know people using those uh, beaches are getting sick. Um, and so we've gone into Lake Michigan, we've done some studies, they know that those people are getting sick. We know people are getting sick on um, Chicago waterways, even though they're just boating. This is secondary recreation. Um, and so this was uh, shown through epidemiological studies. Now, is that gonna get worse? We don't know. The last waterborne recreational outbreak, the, the, the highest number of recreational outbreaks was due to toxic algal blooms. So that's another risk from recreational exposure that we haven't addressed yet. And people were getting respiratory uh, impacts, headaches. Um, they were getting gastrointestinal impacts from these toxic algal blooms. Uh, and, and it wasn't visible. It wasn't like it was a visible, uh, you know, big bloom that they were swimming in. And so I think that we're going to see, um, unless we do more to take the phosphorus out of our waters in the future and do more to clean up our wastewaters, we're going to see more of these uh, risks along these near shore um, situations. More questions? More questions on this side before I run over to the other side? <laughs> you had your chance. I'm going to the other side. One sec. <laughs> to the other side. It's such a big room. You're not running up the steps, though. <laughs> Need someone to raise their hand way, there, way back there in the back. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joan. Always a pleasure to see you speak. Can you speak to the importance of non-point, non-human sources of fecal contamination compared to point sources, in, in, particularly in North America? Yeah, I mean, you know, there was always this argument that human wastewater was of the higher risk. More pathogens, human, you know, human pathogens in there. But you know, we've got really close um, relationship now, I'd say, um, between uh, the animal waste and our water supplies. And so we know these zoonotic pathogens are there. We don't know what their concentrations are. And we, the most important thing about the non-point source and the risk is the transport and fate. So what we're finding with source tracking markers, we've done cow and bovine and chicken markers. In low flow, when everything's frozen and it's groundwater in our rivers, we may have 30% of our watersheds. We did 64 watersheds. 30% of our watersheds are positive for these markers. When spring melt comes, goes up. When summer rains come, the whole 64 watersheds, 80% of them turn red, positive. Now they change in concentration and we found watersheds that are very high in concentrations so we have this yardstick now of, of what kind of concentrations might we find in different rivers under different flow regimes. So it's coming off the land, it's getting some dilution, but certain watersheds have really high concentrations, they're found all the time, other watersheds don't. So what, what's going on on the land? These are both agricultural watersheds based. What's happening there? And one of the things we found, even at this 10,000 foot level, was buffers. If there was no septic tanks, and there was no agriculture in these buffers. And this was a map buffer. It wasn't an agricultural best management buffer. So it was a mapping buffer of 60 meters. The bovine marker, the pig marker, the chicken marker, and phosphorus were lower when you had buffers. So now we sort of have this yardstick under flow regimes. We need to go in the hot, to the hot spots and do some pathogen monitoring. We sort of triage it because the expense of doing the pathogen monitoring is pretty high. So is there more crypto there, for example? Is there going to be more salmonella? Is there going to be more campylobacter? These are the, the questions we have in terms of, uh, and are they alive? Because we're using DNA markers, and we need to know if this is the source, and this is the transport, and this is the exposure site, what's happening to these pathogens. So I, I don't think we have enough data, but I think that we do have some hot spots, and I think that these areas are at risk of zoonotic disease to, to the, the public getting exposed to these waterways. More questions? No one? Yes. 
Um, just thinking back to last summer, I, w I uh, worked at a camp that was on Mantulan Island, which is further up, I believe, on Lake Huron, way up north. And one of the things we did for the week was that we would take water from the lake, but it was filtered through a UV filter before anyone in the camp drank it. Uh, my question is, like, how practical is something like that for the future? You know, being able to, like, is a UV filter going to be enough to, like, filter this kind of thing? And, you know, where should we be looking for water resources for communities? Right. So I'm not sure what kind of a system it was. It might have been a filter followed by UV disinfection. But UV disinfection is 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 very viable approach, and we know it works. It works very well for crypto. So chlorine just doesn't work, and UV is very effective. It might not be so good for adenoviruses, so you have to adjust the lamp if you think you have a human adenovirus present, if there's sewage around. So, um, and generally, we do put a filter first because we want the turbidity down for UV to work. Now, right now, the water industry is talking about energy water nexus. And so any of these processes that we use, where we, like membranes or UV, there's an energy cost, right? And so uh, also, if you can imagine, I don't know how much volume you were treating at the little camp, and you had this lamp, but what if you had to expand that to a whole city and use UV? So you have these banks and banks of UV lamps, and it's very expensive energy-wise. You have to maintain those lamps. They're looking at LD UV, UV lamps, LED UV lamps now, to see whether they can modify those, and those will save some energy, save some time, some other things. Self-cleaning materials, so you don't have to clean them all the time. So it's definitely a technology that's used in water. It's used in wastewater. Um, it's not widespread yet, because I think there needs to be some innovation still. But they're definitely systems, and they provide the barriers that you need. Mm -hmm. To wrap up. Thank you all for uh, coming and please join me once again in giving a very loud hand of applause for, for the Thank you.